if you have your Bibles this morning, would you open them with me to Matthew chapter 16? We're going to conclude our, uh, our series entitled God is Bigger. We talked about God is bigger than a box, God is bigger than a shot, and God is bigger than the throne that I want to possess in my own life. God deserves the throne of my heart. So we're going to take a look at that this morning. Matthew chapter 16, we'll begin with verse number 24 as our text. And Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me. Now, now watch this. I believe this is speaking more than the historical context. I believe this is what Jesus says to all people across all generations. And I believe the reason that you're at Grace Fellowship this morning is because of this statement. You want to follow Christ. You want to know Christ. You want to honor Christ. You want Him to be glorified in your life. I don't believe that you're here just because it's Sunday and you're supposed to be here and you're clicking it off to to do things for this week. I believe you're here because you want to follow Christ. And Jesus says, well, if you want to follow me, let's make sure we understand what that looks like. He says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross And then let him follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he will find it. For what profit is it it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father and with his angels. And then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Will you bow for a word of prayer with me this morning? Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. We thank you for your presence that we sense in this room We thank you for all those in the room and those watching online. And Father, I pray that you would speak to each heart, that not one of us would leave here today without knowing in our own heart the depths of our own being that truly today God has spoken to me and I'll never be the same. Father, I thank you in advance for it and I trust you for it. In Jesus' name and together the body of Christ said, Amen. Chuck Colson, a noted Christian leader in America, stated the greatest challenge facing the church today is to reassert the lordship of Jesus Christ. Some would argue, I don't believe that's necessary. Yet polling and data suggest the great need of reestablishing the fact that Jesus longs to be more than just our Savior. He longs to be our Lord and our Master. In a recent poll polled by relevant research, they asked a large portion of Christians, church members, and they started polling them on some questions, and this is the result. Out of all the church members in America, they determined that 10% of them cannot even be found. 20% of those never attend church. 30 or 25% of church members in America admit they never pray. 30% admit they never read their Bible. 40% of members in churches in America never give financially to the church. 60% never give to world missions. 75% never assume a ministry within the local church. And 95% of church members today acknowledge they have never led anyone to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Yet, 100% of church members believe that they will all go to heaven. The Lordship of Christ is such an important construct in the faith of those who claim Christ. For it answers one very important question. Who will be number one in my life? Who makes the decisions that govern my life? Who has the right to lead and guide and control and direct my footsteps? This is something that we all struggle with, not just those who are trying to sort out the Christian faith, but all of us wrestle with this idea, who is number one in our life? And this battle is not made easier because of the culture that you and I live in. Our culture today is lived by the mantra of Burger King, your way 
right away. That somehow we have bought into the idea that life is all about me, my dreams, my hope, my aspirations, my will. But Jesus teaches us something substantially different. Something that is counterculture to our day. He says, no, to follow me means that you lay down your will, your dreams, your hope, your aspirations, and your desires that you might follow me with all of your heart for the will that I have for your life. It's a battle we all sense. We live in a culture where humanism has taken deep roots in our hearts. Say, Tony, what's humanism? Well, it's a philosophy or system of thought that places prime importance to humans rather than the divine. It's not that we just deal with humanism, we deal with secular humanism. And secular humanism is the idea that humanity is capable of morality and self-fulfillment without a belief in any type of God. Ultimately, it says that we as humans are the center of all things important and that life should revolve around me. And Jesus calls us as his followers to a different kingdom. A kingdom that is built upside down relative to the kingdom of this world. A kingdom in which he says, if you want to find your life, what you do is you lose your life. He says, and if you lose your life, it's because you're trying to hold on to your life. That's the lordship of Jesus Christ. And each of us have to decide consistently, daily, weekly, monthly, throughout our life, who's going to be number one in my life who has the right to the throne of my heart who can sit in the seat of the decisions of my life is it me or is it the Lord Jesus Christ the reality though is this is not a 21st century western Christian problem though we live in that context this is really the problem of the human story if I can take you all the way back to the garden found in Genesis We discover that God creates all things in six beautiful days. There he forms all things for himself and for his glory. And the Bible says that all things that were created were created by him and for him. The apex of that creation is humanity. And we are created in the likeness and the image of God himself. God places us in this wonderful garden in which he has provided everything that we would ever need. And he says, I want to walk with you in the cool of the day. I want to lead your life and guide your life. I want to have fellowship with you and I want you to experience my love. What a deal that is. What an opportunity God has given us. This delightful, unbelievably gracious opportunity to live with the Almighty God. But God says, there is one thing I need to make sure you're clear on. There is going to be this one tree in the midst of the garden that I do not want you to fool with. I don't want you to eat from it. I don't want you to touch from it. I want you to leave it alone because that's going to be the outward sign of the inward condition of your heart that I am Lord and you are not. That I am in control and that your life is led by me. Well, I want to pick up that story if I can in Genesis chapter 3. Most of us know how it concludes. It's not great. But I want you to hear what the evil one placed in the heart of our first parents, Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter number 3, beginning with verse number 1. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat it, you shall not touch it, lest you die. Now watch this, verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows in that day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God. You no longer have to yield your heart to God. You no longer have to submit your life to God. Because if you disobey, you can crawl up upon the throne of your own heart and your own life. And you can make all the decisions for yourself. And you can be like God. You can be sovereign over yourself. It was an issue of lordship. Who's number one in my life? Who's number one in their life? Well, we all know how terrible that story ends, right? Uh, They're deceived and they disobey God. And in that horrible moment, 
of human tragedy, man is separated from a God who loves him and prepared a perfect life for him. Why? Because man chose in that moment, I want to be like God and I want to rule and reign from the throne of my own life and I want to make the decisions that I want to make. I wish I could say that this was only a human problem, but it seems to be a problem in almost all of creation. You will remember just a moment ago I spoke of Satan, the evil one. (laughs) Uh, But some of us don't realize that he hasn't always been the evil one. Matter of fact, his name hasn't always been Satan. There was a time when Satan's name was different. It was called Lucifer. And there was a time in which he was not adversarial towards God. Matter of fact, he was one of the great archangels in heaven. Matter of fact, he was the worship leader of heaven. He led the band. He led the worship. He was created with all these beautiful emeralds and all these beautiful stones. And he had instruments actually coming out of his, his created being. And he would lead the worship of heaven as they gave honor and glory to God Almighty. But one day Lucifer said, you know what? I'm tired of yielding to his throne. I don't want his throne to rule and reign over my life. I'm tired of everybody giving him praise and honor. What about me? And Isaiah, a prophet who lived about 800 years before the birth of Christ, he records this event that took place in the heavenlies. It was an issue of lordship. Who gets to sit upon The stool, the throne of our lives. Notice, if you will, I want to read this to you out of Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. We hear this lament. It says, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning. You were cut down to the ground. You were weakened by the nations. You have weakened the nations, excuse me. And verse 13 tells us why. For you have said in your heart. I will ascend to the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And Lucifer begins this revolt in heaven, a revolt that would Draw one third of the created beings with him. Why? Because Lucifer said, I no longer want you to sit upon your throne. I no longer give you right of that. But now I'm going to try to usurp that because I want my throne and I want my kingdom and I want my way and I want my decisions to rule and reign. This is not just an issue that happened in the heavenlies. It's not just an issue that happens in the garden. This is an issue that we see that Jesus himself had to deal with. Now, when we think about Jesus Christ, we think about his glorious ministry, his powerful teachings, the miracles that he performed. But before Jesus began his public ministry, he started in a wilderness. You remember that? The Bible says that as he begins... The Spirit of God leads him into the wilderness so that he would be tempted of the evil one. And what would that temptation be? Simply sin? No, it was an issue of the lordship of his father in his own heart. You'll remember that as Jesus was there, the Bible says Satan comes and he begins to tempt him. He says, listen, Jesus, I know you're really hungry. You haven't had anything to eat. Why don't you use the power that God has given you? And why not turn these stones into bread? And Jesus said, no, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm not going to use that which God has given me to make the decisions of my own life. For God's word has already declared that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds by the father's mouth. I am going to allow the Lord's goodwill and plan to continue to reign in my life. We pick up the story. I want to read you this. We see it in Matthew chapter four. The Bible says next, the devil took Jesus to the peak of every high mountain. Watch this in the light of lordship. Who's in charge? Who's number one? And the evil one showed him all the nations of the world and all of their glory. Verse nine, 
I will give it all to you, the devil said, if you will kneel down and worship me. You can translate this without doing any violence to the scripture. If you will get God off the throne of your heart and if you'll bow down and let me take the throne of your heart. He says, if you'll do this, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world. I'll give you all this glory if you'll do that. Jesus' response, get out of here, Satan. For the scripture says you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And where Adam and Eve fell, where Lucifer fell, Jesus shows us the example. Where we decide by the grace of God that, Lord, I want you to rule and reign on the throne of my heart. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to make the decisions. I give you the rightful place upon the throne of my heart. Lord, I want you to be number one. The disciples no doubt saw this. And when they come to him in Luke chapter 11, they said, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? Would you show us how to minister into the Father in prayer? And Jesus says, sure, I will gather around. And he gives them what we know today is the Lord's prayer, the Our Father. And as Jesus gives us the first line, it's a line concerning the Lordship of God Almighty in our life. Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus says the way we begin is reestablishing once again that it is not our name that needs to be established. It's not our kingdom that needs to grow. It's not our fame and our glory. No, it is all for the glory of the Father. And we say, Lord, I establish you as I begin this prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Great is your name. Exalted is your name. Not my name, God. Your name is great, not my will, but your will be done. And when Jesus closes out what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about lordship again. He says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. He says, this is how you start this prayer about the lordship of the Father. And this is how you settle the prayer. You settle it with the lordship. This is about your kingdom. This is about your name. This is about your fame. To you be all glory and honor and praise now and forevermore. Jesus continues to model this truth. That God deserves the right to the throne of our heart fully and completely. In Luke chapter 22, when Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane praying and he's crying out to the Father knowing that in just a few moments he will be arrested, he'll be brutally beaten, he'll be crucified on the cross for the sins of humanity. Jesus in that dark moment cries out, God, is there any way, Father, that this cup can pass from my hand? But not my will. Your will be done. That's about lordship. That's about settling the issue. Who's number one in my life? And I'm afraid that maybe, possibly, it has crept into the Christian community of faith. That we have settled with the idea that being a Christian is all about praying a prayer that we refer to as the prayer of salvation, marking it off our list, and going about our business. But Jesus says, no, I'm calling you to something bigger. I'm calling you to something greater. By which you daily deny yourself. Deny myself. What does that mean? I deny myself even the throne of my own heart. And I take up my cross, my responsibility. And I follow you as you lead, as you guide, as you direct. Every Christian has to learn this. And it's a struggle. Can we be honest with that? It's a struggle to let the Lord be the Lord in every place of our life. But he calls us to that. We see John the Baptist, that great final Old Testament prophet. His ministry is flourishing. Thousands of people are flocking to hear this guy preach. He's baptizing hundreds every day. But he realizes that his throne is not the important throne. And he makes this statement, I must decrease so Christ might 
increase. In other words, his kingdom is more important than my kingdom. His ministry is more powerful than my ministry. So much so, John said, when this Jesus shows up, the Messiah, he's going to be so powerful. I baptize you in water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And he is so worthy, so much more worthier than I, to the point I'm not even worthy to take off his sandals. Peter had to learn it. Peter had to realize after he had blown it, after he had denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times, do you remember what Peter did? He didn't go to the altar and ask God for forgiveness. He said, I can't do this. I'm going fishing. I'm going back to my old life because I can't live for Christ. I can't live this life out. And Jesus comes and asks him three questions. One question three times. Peter, do you love me? Peter, will you allow me to sit upon the throne of your heart even when you blow it? Peter, do you love me even when life doesn't go the way you want it to go, when you want to be in charge? Will you submit authority to your life to me? Peter, even when your future is not the future you think you want it to be, will you love me and trust me? It's something that we all have to learn. And can I tell you, it's a difficult learning process. There is something so counterintuitive in our own hearts about this. I've had to learn this, and I'm still learning this. I'll tell you a little story of one of the ways the Lord began to deal with me in my own heart and the Lordship that He longs to be in my life. I don't know what industry or trade you're a part of, but chances are in your industry and in your trade, there are different trade magazines and publications that come out to tell you about the trends and the things that are going on in your industry. Well, that happens in the church world as well. Did you realize that the church is a $95 billion organization in America? There's a lot of trade industry going on. There's a lot of people out there telling us about the trends of church growth and what needs to happen and what you need to do in order to make everything just perfect. A few years ago, I was sitting in my office and one of those trade magazines came in. And this is a magazine that each year they do a report on the 500 top churches in America. The 250th fastest growing churches in America and the 250 top most influential pastors in America and the 100 top most influential young pastors in America. I remember getting that magazine and going up to my office and I started thumbing through it and I started seeing all these churches and what God was doing in them and I recognized their names and I actually knew a few of them and I would see their numbers and how they've increased and something began to rise up in me. And it wasn't good. Matter of fact, it was almost sinister, if I can be that honest with you. Something began to cause me to feel very insecure. And very marginalized. It caused me to sense a lack of validation in what God had done at Grace or was doing at Grace Fellowship. And I felt this insecurity begin to rise up in me. I wasn't rejoicing in what God was doing in these other churches. No. I sensed jealousy. I, I wanted to begin to shoot at these guys. Wait a minute. I know this church. They don't have that many people. These people are liars. I can't believe they would do this. And I began to feel very insignificant. And in order to deal with my own sense of insufficiency, I allowed this spirit of competition to rise up in my own heart. Listen, I'm competitive. I, I don't want to lose anything. I don't want to lose that goldfish. I don't want to lose at Tennessee. Go dogs. I... I figure if you're keeping score, you ought to win. Can I get a witness from anyone in this house that can 
don't act they're all holy up there. This is, uh, granted, you may never deal with this insecurity. You may never have to overcome these things in your industry. So just allow this to be my therapy session, all right? You just sit there and nod your head very politely and say things like this. Tell me more. All right, let, let this be that moment for me. Is that all right? Can you give your pastor that today? Well, apparently you think I need a lot of therapy. I see what... I see what just happened there. But I've learned that even though God may have placed within me this competitive drive, that's great on a ball field or on a court somewhere. But being competitive and always having a win doesn't always play out in every sector of our life. I can tell you it doesn't in your marriage. Can anyone testify here that you can win and still lose in certain situations? You can, you can be right all the way to divorce court. And I started feeling this unbelievable sense of insecurity. And so how do you deal with your insecurity? You normally feed your insecurity. Well, we're going to work harder. We're going to come up with more programs. We're going to come up with more evangelistic tools. We're going to work and drive harder. And we're going to do better. And we're going to get on this list. Pastor Jeff, call this organization. Figure out how do we get ourselves on this list? What type of numbers do they need? And, and call the staff together because we're not doing this anymore. we got to get better, faster, stronger, faster, stronger, bigger, faster, stronger, bigger. And all of a sudden, you begin not to lead in love. And follow the master. You begin to drive. And you begin to torment all those around you. And I had struggled with this now for a few weeks. And I, but every day I'd walk in and I would just see this magazine. And I'd think. Until finally in a moment of clarity. In a moment of clarity. I realized God something in me is not synced up with who you are. Because this is not about your kingdom. This is not about your church. This is not about people coming to salvation. This somehow has crept into the reality that this is about me. And somehow this magazine is, is bringing to bear something in me that is not submitted to who you are. And in a moment of great clarity, I got up from my couch in my office and I walked over and I threw it in the garbage can. And I said to myself, my wife is always thankful when I get my garbage in the garbage can too. Uh, so that's probably wives who are celebrating. And I said, Lord, the problem is here is that it's not about your kingdom. It's not about your name or your fame. The problem is, Lord, is I want to control the throne of my own heart. And what you're calling me to, Lord Jesus, is to surrender this chair to you. Is to say, Lord, I want you to be Lord over my life and Lord over your church. And what I've discovered in this journey is it hasn't made me any less determined to win people to Christ and to grow his church that would be a beautiful light in a community. Matter of fact, I may be more determined for that now than ever. But now I can tell you by the grace of God and as clearly as I can see my own heart, this is about let thy kingdom come here. Amen. Let your will be done here. Let your name be the one that's famous here. Lord, I don't need my name in some magazine to validate who you are in me and what you desire to do in me, for me, and through me. So, Lord, I'm going to get off that seat of my own heart and I'm going to surrender that to you and I'm going to trust you. And the Lord reminded me of this one little passage. It's found in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. In other words, I want you to think, Paul says, like Jesus was thinking. How was he thinking? He says, Jesus, who was being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But he made of himself 
Watch this. No reputation. Taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death on the cross. When Jesus said, this throne belongs to you, Father. And now as a follower of Christ, my prayer is to be, Lord, I want the throne of my heart. I want it to belong to you and you alone. I want to trust you with this. And I want you to rule and reign in this place. I want you to look at one more passage of scripture before we come to the altar for communion this morning. Because Jesus helps us to understand what it really means to allow him to be Lord. Luke chapter number nine, if you have your Bibles. Luke chapter number nine. And it's verses 57 through 63. The context is Jesus is walking with his disciples, not just the twelve, but others who are walking with him. He says in verse 57 of Luke nine. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, watch this, watch this. Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Someone rises up and gives this bold declaration. Jesus, wherever you go, I will go with you. But Jesus reads beyond his words and he begins to discern this guy's heart. And Jesus responds in verse 58. And Jesus said to him, <coughs> foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Do you understand? Following me is not just something you say, but it's going to cost you something. It's going to be inconvenient at times. Verse 59 says, and another one said to him, and Jesus said to another, follow me. But this guy said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, well, let the dead bury their own. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. Now we read that and we think, oh, how how rude of Jesus, how Jesus lacked compassion. Here's a guy who's willing to follow him. And he's had a death in his family. And Jesus doesn't even want him to go grieve and mourn and take care of his own family responsibilities. That is not what this moment is about. This is about a man who is making a promise with his lips that is incongruent with his own heart. Jesus says, all right, really? You want to follow me with all your heart? You want to do that? Okay, just come on. Well, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I need to. Another one. In verse number 61 said, Lord, I will follow you. I will follow you. I will let you be the Lord of my life. I will let you be number one and direct my steps. I will follow you, but let me first go and bid farewell to those who are at my house. And Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow and then looking back is fit for the kingdom. This can be either seen as Jesus making impossible demands. Or Jesus is discerning the real condition of their heart, which is. I want all the benefits that come with following you, but I'm not willing to pay the price. For what it means to truly follow you. I'm not going to give you full privilege and right over my life. See, what Lordship settles is this. Who gets to make the decisions of my life? Is it me or is it Christ? What we discover in this story is this, is that not everyone is ready for Lordship. None of them actually were ready in this story. They all talked the talk, but they were unwilling to, unwilling to fulfill what they had promised. We see in this text that lordship is more than words. It's more than what we just say on Sunday morning. Jesus sees our true heart. He sees me exactly for who I am. And haven't we all at one point or another tried to snow God? We see that lordship forces us to change. We'll either change for the glory of God or we'll change and allow ourselves to continue to ride on the throne of our own life. We see also in this little bitty passage 
that lordship means that I am willing to accept the future regardless of the cost in order to follow Christ. Lord, I don't know where you're going to lead me. I don't know what it looks like, but God, where shall I go? Only you have the words to eternal life. Lordship means that I'm willing to leave the past regardless of the past pull in my life. Lordship means seizing the moment regardless of the inconvenience. Oh, Lordship has been lost in the modern church. But there are moments in which we see what it looks like when a person has really settled the issue concerning who is number one in their life. I'll close with this. Many of us watched the news over the past couple of weeks about the unthinkable tragedy that happened in Texas when an off-duty police officer named uh, Amber Geiger entered into her apartment or what she thought was her apartment. But unfortunately, she was deeply misunderstood standing. And she walked into a man named Botham Jane's apartment thinking it was hers and just coming off duty after a long night at work, she sees a man who she believes has broken into her house. She takes out her service revolver. And after a few words, she shoots him and he dies. She's horrified as to what happens. They call the law. All this takes place and she is placed on trial. Many of us watched the evening news as they were showing different moments of the trial. The judge at the end of the prosecutions and the defense portion of the trial turned it over to the jury and in just a few moments the jury comes back with a guilty verdict. It's painful, it's tragic. And nearly everybody in the national news media now kind of pulls away for it and they said all that's left now is the sentencing portion of the trial. Well, as many of you have watched either on news or maybe you have actually experienced it in person. During the sentencing portion of a case like this, the family members and loved ones and community leaders and people that are on the victim's side, if you will, they have an opportunity to speak to the judge and the jury and those who will be sent deciding the sentencing. And if you've ever watched these, these are such painful moments in the courtroom. There's such hurt and brokenness and anger and sense of, of a demand for justice. And, and, and who, would, who, would, who would argue against that? Of course it is. Someone that you love has tragically been killed. Your heart is broken. You're going to have to find a new normal. The person you love is no longer going to... Why wouldn't they be in pain? But something remarkable happened. When Botham's brother, Brant, went to the witness stand. When he had an opportunity to give a testimony about his brother and what he thought the sentencing should be, we discover a young man who has settled this issue, at least in this moment of his life, that Jesus is Lord. And when I allow him to be the Lord and sit upon the throne of my heart, I can trust him in everything. And many of you have seen this testimony, but I want to show it to you one more time. And I want you to look at it through the eyes of Lordship. Who rules and reigns from the throne of this young man's life? And here's that moment. I can throw myself. I, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die.
just like my brother did, but I see I I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't gonna ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not going to say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? John Maxwell said, when you give Jesus the center of your life, He'll take care of the circumference. When you allow Jesus to be the Lord of your life, then you can love recklessly and beautifully. When you allow Jesus to sit upon the throne of your life, you can submit yourself and everything in your life to Him. And you can trust it. Great football coach Tony Dungy said of this moment. He says this young man is living out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Which goes against everything in our human nature. This could only happen by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because this young man is absolutely confident. That because of Christ he will see his brother again. The question this morning is simply this. Who rules the throne of your heart? Who sits upon the seat of number one in your life? Mm -hmm.